Chapter 1 Coral ate slowly as she peered at Jackson from under her lashes. She knew her sister, Esther, and her brother-in-law, Brody, both desperately wanted her to marry him, so she could move from their home. He didn't seem like a terrible person, and he was obviously intelligent. He'd do. As long as he'd agree to her terms, of course. She listened to the other three talk as she ate the meal she'd overseen the preparations for. Her sister had only barely learned to cook, and she would have lots of difficulties once Coral was married and gone, but that didn't matter. She'd been married almost a week, and she still hadn't been able to consummate her marriage, because her sister lived there in her tiny little cabin. Coral and Esther had grown up with money, but just seven weeks before, they'd discovered their father was an embezzler. Esther's fiancé, and the son of the man their father was embezzling from, had immediately called off their wedding, and Esther had agreed to be a mail-order bride. She hadn't told her future husband, Brody, that she was bringing her sister along to live with them, though. Tell me about yourself, Coral, Jackson said, his voice strong and deep. It wasn't a question either. It was an order. He was demanding she tell him about herself. What do you want to know? Coral asked, needing to learn about him, rather than disclose any information about herself at all. What if he wasn't the one she'd end up marrying? She didn't want him to know anything about her. She'd had enough gossip spread about her back in Massachusetts. She didn't need that nonsense here in Montana. Jackson stared at her, noting that she still wasn't looking at him. Was she shy? Anything you want to tell me. What do you like to do in your spare time? At that, Coral's eyes met his. Back home I enjoyed studying anatomy textbooks and daydreaming that someday someone would allow me to become a doctor, even though I'm a woman. I doubt if I'll be able to continue that particular activity. Jackson blinked a couple of times. He sensed something other than shyness in her voice. She didn't seem shy at all suddenly. No, she seemed angry. But at whom? Why won't you continue? Did you not bring your books? Coral raised one eyebrow at him, the brown, just a shade darker than her auburn hair. I brought my books. I just have an inkling that whomever I end up married to will want his wife to do things he considers important, instead of reading about being a doctor, which will never happen in this world. Why won't it? You don't think you're capable? Jackson asked, knowing he was going to annoy her with the question, but unable to stop it from escaping his lips. It was how he motivated his students. I know I'm capable. I just don't think anyone else will believe I'm capable, because I'm a female. He shrugged. There has to be a first for everything. Do you think the first man who said he could move west and ranch was believed? If you think you can, then you've fought 90% of the battle. He finished his meal and thanked her when dessert was put before him. After eating her delicious gingerbread, he pushed away from the table and invited her to walk with him. As they walked away from the house, he was aware they could be watched from the windows of the small cabin. He knew her sister and brother-in-law had invested a lot of hope on the two of them getting married, but he wasn't sure how they'd do together. Coral was obviously intelligent, a trait he admired, but she was also headstrong. He would have preferred a malleable wife. So I hear you need to marry, he said, refusing to beat around the bush with the woman. I enjoyed your dessert. Do you cook as well as you bake? Coral gave a brief nod. I'm an excellent cook. In fact, I think you'll find I excel at everything I do. He laughed briefly. No one is good at everything. So I've been told, she said, refusing to argue with the man. But you're good at everything? She nodded again. Maybe it's only my perception, though. Of course, she knew it wasn't. She'd even heard her sister and Brody laughing at how good she was at everything, as if it was a fault, when she knew darn well it wasn't. Jackson stared at her for a moment, looking her up and down. She wasn't classically pretty. Her hair was red, and she was covered in freckles. 
She was rounder than was fashionable, but her eyes were absolutely stunning. She'd do. He didn't need a beauty anyway. He just needed someone who would cook his meals and be a good companion. She'd surely have opinions on everything and be willing to debate whenever he needed a good argument. While he'd prefer someone who would recognize his authority in everything, a woman who could hold her own may be just what he needed. Why are you in such a hurry to marry? he asked. There is such an overwhelming ratio of men to women here, you'd have no trouble finding a husband if you'd just let nature take its course. She sighed at his words. That's what I thought when we left Massachusetts, but Esther and Brody's marriage isn't going to work if I stay much longer. I'm in the way. She didn't mention the fact that the couple hadn't been able to consummate their marriage, but she knew he'd understand. I see. How old are you? he asked. She seemed so smart, but really, she didn't look much older than some of his students. I'm 17. My 18th birthday is in November. I don't really think anyone should marry before they turn 18, but I don't feel like I have a choice. I would ask that you'd wait to consummate the marriage for that long if you do decide to marry me. She started to tell him that normally she wouldn't be so frank about such an intimate topic, but she stopped herself. Why lie? Is that a proposal? Coral refused to blush, which she knew had to be the only reason for his words. No, she wouldn't give him the pleasure of getting embarrassed. If you want it to be, it is. Do you want to marry me? He blinked, surprised that Coral hadn't reacted to his teasing. Most women would rather be tortured than ask a man to marry them. I can't wait to tell our children that their mother proposed to me within an hour and a half of meeting me. I guess that's a yes? He nodded, not certain if he enjoyed her frankness or was put off by it. When do you want to do it? Could we make it to Lost Legacy and back before you have to go to school on Monday morning? He pursed his lips, thinking about it. I'm relatively certain we can make it work. We'll both be tired Monday, but it can't be helped. Coral stepped toward him, knowing she was being forward, but just not caring. You don't think you should kiss me to seal the engagement? He looked down at her, surprised by how pretty her upturned face looked to him by the light of the full moon overhead. Do you think that's wise? If we're not going to consummate for two months, shouldn't we wait to start kissing? Don't you want to know that we're compatible? He laughed. We're compatible. I don't need to kiss you to know that. Coral took a step back, surprised that she was disappointed. Obviously, he found the idea of kissing her to be a chore. What a way to start a marriage. Let's go tell Esther and Brody then. If we're getting such an early start, surely you need to go home and sleep. She turned on her heel and strode toward the house, not looking back at him. If Jackson didn't want to kiss her, then she had no reason to stand with him in the dark. The man already made her crazy. Jackson hurried to catch up with her, realizing he'd hurt her feelings by not wanting to kiss her. He hadn't explained it well. Coral, wait. It's not that I don't want to kiss you. Coral shrugged and kept walking, until he caught her hand and pulled her to a stop. What? I don't want to start kissing you and then have to stop. I don't think it's a good idea for us to get our passions all riled up and then have to wait for two months. She nodded briefly, not meeting his eyes. I understand. Your voice tells me you understand, but your body language is saying differently. I don't think you do understand. Does it really matter? You're getting your cook. I'm getting out of my sister's house, so she can be a newlywed. Nothing else really matters, does it? Yes, it does. I don't want to hurt your feelings with this. He watched her face, but she kept her eyes downcast, so he couldn't read them. I'll kiss you. He pulled her to him with the hand he still held his free hand moving to tilt her chin up. Coral turned her face away. I'm not going to kiss an unwilling man. What kind of girl do you think I am, 
He wanted to laugh, knowing he'd already made a mess of things. Just let me kiss you once, so I can put your fears to rest. What fears? I told you, I'm good at everything, which means I'm afraid of nothing. Let's go inside and tell my sister the good news. He sighed. If she didn't want to kiss him, then she didn't want to kiss him. He didn't want to kiss her anyway, did he? Then why did he suddenly feel so disappointed? He kept her hand in his, and she half dragged him back to the house. For such a short woman, she was very strong. He wasn't sure if he liked that or not. He wanted her to feel like she needed him to keep her safe. When they reached the house, Esther and Brody were standing close, but they jumped apart as if embarrassed to be found that way. Coral quickly explained the situation. The plans were made for him to return to get her at four the following morning, and he left quickly, not trying to kiss Coral again. The woman was being downright persnickety about that, and he wasn't going to fight her for the privilege. Coral ignored all the arguments from her sister and went to the sink, rolling up her sleeves. When Esther sent her to bed, she went willingly. She knew she wouldn't really sleep that night, but she had to at least try. Why, she was getting married. Tomorrow or Sunday at the latest. She went to the room she shared with Esther and pulled her dress off, quickly changing into her nightgown. It was eight, and four would come very early. She packed up all of her things into the two carpet bags she'd brought with her from Massachusetts, before climbing into the bed and rolling onto her side. Her tears fell as soon as she was covered up to her chin. How could she possibly marry a man who didn't even want to kiss her? Their lives together would never be worth anything. Oh how she wished she had time to just be a young woman and court whomever came along. It wasn't that she didn't like Jackson, of course. She did. She just didn't want to feel forced into a marriage. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Tomorrow would be a new day. Tomorrow she would be strong. Tomorrow would be a blessing. It always was. Chapter 2 Waking earlier than necessary after a fitful night's sleep, Coral hurriedly carried her carpet bags into the main room of the cabin to wait for Jackson. She wanted to put her face in her hands and sob, but what if someone hurt her? No, she wouldn't show weakness. She couldn't. She was a bride, whether she wanted to be or not. When she heard Jackson's buggy pull up into the yard, she hurried outside, wishing she had someone to ride along with them as a chaperone. She wasn't afraid of him, but it wasn't natural to be alone with a man she wasn't married to. Well, it didn't feel natural to her anyway. She'd always been very strict with her moral code for herself, worried she'd take after her birth mother in every way. Jackson didn't get down from the buggy, but he did offer her a hand and help her up. She threw her bag into the back, smoothed her skirts, and covered herself with the lap robe he was already under. How did you sleep? he asked, his voice sounding deeper than it had the night before. Coral felt a shiver travel up her spine. His voice did things to her that she could never admit to. Fine, she lied. She wasn't about to tell her fiancé that she'd spent the entire night tossing and turning, trying to figure out how she could leave her sister's house but still not marry yet. She'd come to no conclusions. Jackson drove out onto the road, looking at Coral out of the corner of his eye. Something was wrong, but he had no idea what it was. That's good. What did one say to the woman he was about to marry, when one knew almost nothing about her? Coral sighed, wishing things weren't quite so awkward between them. What are you getting out of this, she asked bluntly, knowing she'd either offend him, and he'd turn the buggy around and take her right back to her sister, or it would break the ice between them. She wasn't certain which she preferred at that moment. He frowned, wondering if she would always say exactly what was on her mind. I'm a terrible cook, he admitted. I hate doing household chores. I want to be able to teach all day and come home to a clean house and supper on the table. Well, that's honest. She stared off into the darkness, knowing the sun wouldn't be up for a couple of hours yet.
I can do those things. And eventually, I'll have a wife to warm my bed and children. She swallowed hard at his words. But not until after I turn 18, right? And we get used to each other? She hated the idea of going straight to his bed, even though she was strongly attracted to him. The woman who had given birth to her had been her father's mistress. She considered her mother to be the woman who had raised her and her father's wife. She had no desire to be like her birth mother, a woman whose life was ruled by passion. At least, that's what she assumed her birth mother was like. She'd never met the woman. Jackson shook his head. Of course not. I gave you my word. He was offended that she would even question him. A man's word should never be questioned by his wife. Then he sighed. The woman barely knew him. Of course, she wouldn't simply take him at his word. How could she? I'll install a lock on your door if necessary. Coral looked over at him in the darkness. You have two bedrooms then? He shook his head. I'm afraid not. I have just the one. If you're not comfortable sharing the bed with me platonically, then I will make a bed on the floor in the main room. She frowned. I don't like the idea of you sleeping on the floor, but I'm not sure how I feel about sharing a bed either. Give me a little while, and I'll let you know. Fair enough. He glanced over at her, noticing that she was sitting ramrod, straight on the seat, beside him. She'd never make it all the way to Lost Legacy if she held herself so rigidly. He was worried for her. I'm not going to bite you. She glanced at him, surprised by his words. Why do you say that? He shrugged. You just seem very tense. I've never seen someone sit up so straight when they didn't have to. Really? I don't see a reason to do anything halfway. If you're going to do it, you may as well do it right. Was she really that rigid in thinking as well as posture? No wonder her sister and brother-in-law hadn't been able to wait to get rid of her. Why fatigue yourself when you could rest? If you want, you can use my shoulder to rest against. I'll drive while you sleep. As tired as she was, the offer was tempting. No thank you. I'm fine. She couldn't show him, or anyone else, weakness. Maybe eventually, but not as soon as they met. Tell me about your family. How did you end up teaching in Montana? My mother and stepfather moved to Montana when I was 12. I was already mostly through with my schooling, because I worked as many hours as I could to finish early. When we moved out here, I helped with the farm chores as much as I could, while continuing to study in the evenings. He shrugged. It didn't take me long to determine that I had no desire to be a farmer. I didn't like the idea of relying on the fickle weather for my well-being, so I applied to teach. I took a couple of jobs locally, and I enjoyed them, but I realized that I wanted to teach where there was a greater need for teachers. In a place where students would either have me or no education at all. So when I saw the community here was looking for a teacher, I applied. Are you glad you did? How long have you been at your current post? Her mind started racing. Did that mean he'd be looking for other positions? Would she lose her sister after all? He nodded. I love it here. I have no intention of going anywhere. She wondered if he had read her fears. She hoped not, because having a husband who knew when she was afraid would be downright frightening. She didn't want anyone to have that sort of power over her. I'm glad. I believe I'd like to stay in close proximity to my sister. I take it the two of you are close? Coral shrugged, not quite certain how to answer that. We've always looked out for one another. The truth was that they'd never been particularly close. They were too different. Esther had always been a fashion plate, interested in only the latest dress and whom she would marry. Coral's mind wasn't given to frivolous things like that. Jackson read between the lines, understanding that the sisters hadn't been close. How odd that Coral was determined to stay near her sister then. Tell me about your parents. 
Coral debated simply telling him the story she'd believed when she was young, but decided he deserved the full truth, before they married. Esther and I are half-sisters. I'm the daughter of our father's mistress. We're less than a year apart. When my father told my mother that I was on the way, she agreed to pretend to be pregnant, and then she raised me as if I was her own. Jackson raised an eyebrow at that. She did? There was no resentment or favoritism? I'm sure there was some, but not so anyone on the outside would notice. After my birth, mother became a bit of a recluse. She didn't go out and do all the fun things she'd done leading up to my arrival. She wasn't willing to admit she'd been thwarted by her own husband. So she was cruel to you? Never. She was kind, the same as she was to Esther. She just, well, Esther got more of her attention. She had mother's approval. It was always clear that no one was very interested in me. I was the not as pretty, not as slim, not as socially acceptable younger sister, who was a slight embarrassment to the family. She shrugged. I helped them out by spending most of my time with my nose buried in a book, and then they didn't have to acknowledge me. I made friends with the servants and learned to cook. I really learned anything anyone was willing to teach me. I admire that. Jackson was surprised to realize he did. The girl beside him was slightly frightening with as much as she knew about everything around her, but she was also a marvel, in her own way. She was obviously highly intelligent, and no matter that she'd been born into less than ideal circumstances, she was a bold, confident woman. Do you really? Or does it make you uncomfortable? Why would it make me uncomfortable? She shrugged. I have no earthly idea. It makes everyone else uncomfortable though. People look at me as if I'm some sort of oddity, and they don't quite know what to say or do around me. Like I'm some sort of superhuman, and everything I do is because it's easy, and not hard work. And it's not easy? She frowned. I wouldn't go so far to say that. I do learn things, and become good at things, much faster and easier than other people do. But that doesn't make me any less human. When I see something is going to be difficult for me, I give it everything I have. I work twice as hard, so that I can be as good. People don't see that, though. They just see someone who excels at everything. He nodded. I can understand that. He was slightly surprised by her words, because it was just how he felt about almost everything. I do much of the same thing. You do? She turned to him, barely able to make out his features in the pre-dawn darkness. Of course I do. She didn't think he'd lie about something so small, did she? They would have to build trust between them if they were to ever get along. She smiled. I'm glad to hear we have something in common then. Maybe this one small thing will grow to something more. He smiled at that, transferring the reins into his left hand, and moving his right hand to cover hers in her lap. I certainly hope so. I would hate for the two of us to be forced to live together for the next fifty years with no feelings between us. That would truly be a tragic life to live, wouldn't it? She shook her head. She couldn't imagine living the rest of her life with no love. She'd already lived the first part of it with no one finding her special or good enough. She needed to have someone who thought she was wonderful. Someone who would call her dear and hold her hand when the situation called for it. I think I'm glad you're the one who I'm going to marry, Jackson. He jerked, staring down at her. You are? He'd never expected to hear any sort of kindness from her lips. She nodded. There's something about you that I think I can spend the rest of my life being happy with. I hope so anyway. He squeezed the hand he still held. I'll do my best to make you happy, Coral. I make no promises, because I'm inept at everything where women are concerned, but I do think you're special. We'll make a good team. I do believe we will. I have a feeling you won't mind if I spend time poring over the medical treatises I have, and that will be a good start. He laughed.
As long as you promise to use anything you learn on me should I become ill. Oh, there's no doubt. I shall endeavor to keep you very healthy. She smiled as she stared straight ahead into the darkness. The man beside her wasn't nearly as difficult as she'd thought he would be. Why, he was downright pleasant now that they'd spent a bit more time together. Maybe the future wasn't as bleak as she'd imagined it would be. Chapter 3 It was almost eight that night when they arrived in Lost Legacy, and Jackson drove straight to the preacher's house. I don't want us to spend a night alone together until we've been officially married. Coral agreed, not wanting anything to possibly mar her reputation in her new home. Her legs were cramped as she allowed him to help her down from the buggy, and it was all she could do not to cry out. They'd only made necessary stops along the way, preferring to eat as they drove. I think that's for the best. Jackson knew how hard it was for his legs to support him after their long journey, so he watched her face carefully for any sign of pain, but she showed nothing. Have you met Pastor and Mrs. Sands yet? Yes, I met them when Esther and I arrived in town. He married Brody and Esther. Oh, of course. I didn't think of that. Jackson took hold of her elbow, still worried she might fall after the long drive in cramped quarters. I hope he's willing to perform our ceremony this late. Me too. Coral didn't know what she'd do if he said he wouldn't marry them so late at night. She couldn't ask Jackson to pay for an extra room for her, and she wouldn't feel right spending a night in the same room with him before they married. When Mrs. Sands opened the door, she stared at them blankly for a moment, and then she smiled. Coral, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I'm here to get married myself this time. Mrs. Sands smiled, opening the door wide. The pastor is still working on his sermon for tomorrow, but he won't mind the interruption. Please have a seat. She hurried from the room, presumably to get her husband. Coral walked around the small parlor, trying to get her legs to work correctly again. Jackson watched her and understood what she was doing immediately. I'm sorry we have to push so hard to get home by Sunday night. She stopped her pacing and shook her head. No, there's nothing to be sorry for. We're doing what we need to do. If we had to, we could start driving back tonight. He walked to her taking her hand in his. Life won't always be hard, he promised. She shrugged. From what I can see, it is. And it had been for her. Maybe it would be easier now that they were about to be married, but she didn't see how it could be. They'd just be two people working side by side not a couple who found comfort in one another's presence. Not like Esther and Brody. She felt her eyes sting, as if tears wanted to fall, but she fought them back. No, she wasn't going to cry in front of him. Or anyone else for that matter. Jackson watched her uncertainly. It won't be any more. He hoped it was true. He could see that together they could do wonderful things. If only she would stop being so strong for everyone. The pastor and Mrs. Sands came back into the room then. So, you two want to be married, do you? Jackson nodded. I'm not sure if you remember me, sir. Oh, but I do. You visited my church a couple of times before you left for your little country school. Have you set up your own congregation there as you were hoping to do? Not yet, but I plan to do it soon. Right now, I'm still getting used to being in the classroom. He waved his hand toward Coral. I understand you've already met my bride? Pastor Sands nodded. She was here recently with her older sister. It's good to see you again. I'm sorry, but I've forgotten your name. I'm not exactly memorable, Coral said, trying to get her red curls back into the pins that kept them atop her head. I'm Coral. Are you two ready to start? Coral looked down at herself, wishing she'd changed as soon as they got there. She didn't feel like she could now, because she didn't want to keep everyone waiting. Yes, sir. I'm ready. Jackson nodded, moving over to stand beside his bride. Let's get it done, 
Coral wrinkled her nose at his less-than-romantic words, but really, what did she expect? They were marrying for reasons other than love, and she had no right to expect him to act as if it was any other way. She paid careful attention to the vows, agreeing to love, honor, and cherish him. She was relieved she hadn't been asked to obey, because she'd have had to say no to that. She wasn't obeying anyone as if she didn't have a brain in her head to think for herself. When Pastor Sands told Jackson to kiss her, she turned to Jackson, wondering what he'd do. He put his hands on her shoulders and pulled her to him, his lips coming down on hers gently. Coral was surprised at the rush of feeling that went through her at the touch of Jackson's lips on hers. She'd always assumed the one thing in life she'd be bad at was passion but apparently her birth mother had left her something. She put her hands on his shoulders and kissed him back, a tingling starting at her spine and running down her body. Jackson lifted his head, looking down into his bride's face, stunned at her reaction to him. He'd expected her to be cold and unfeeling, but that was just the opposite of what she'd given him. Her eyes were half-closed and her lips slightly parted. It was all he could do not to lean down and kiss her again. He stepped back, clearing his throat, embarrassed all at once. He'd promised to wait two months before he consummated the marriage. It was going to be the longest two months of his life. Coral opened her eyes fully to see Jackson staring at her as if she were a stranger. I guess we'd better be on our way, she mumbled, trying to cover just what his kiss had done to her. Jackson shook himself out of his reverie. Yes, of course. We have to find a place to stay for the night yet. He turned and shook hands with the pastor, paying him for performing the ceremony. The pastor looked at his wife and back at Jackson. You know we don't have a hotel in Lost Legacy, don't you? Jackson nodded. I was hoping for a boarding house or something. Not that'll take you at this time of night. The pastor looked at Mrs. Sands. How about it? Mrs. Sands nodded immediately. We have a spare room. Of course you'll stay. Oh, but we couldn't. Coral protested. She'd seen the tiny little bed in that room when she'd been there with Esther. No, that wouldn't work at all. Jackson cleared his throat. It's that or sleep outside tonight. Coral's shoulders sagged. He was right. They'd have to stay there. They could make it work. She nodded. We'd be happy to accept your hospitality, Mrs. Sands. Jackson put his arm around her shoulders, casually. We'll have to be up before the sun so we can get on the road, though. Oh, I wish you had time to stay for church, but I understand. Have you eaten tonight? We have some supper left. I made a pot roast and mashed potatoes. Coral looked at Jackson, waiting for his response. Her stomach was growling, but she didn't want to be the only one eating. She felt like they were asking too much just by staying there. Jackson nodded. We'd be much obliged, ma'am. We had sandwiches six hours ago while we drove. Oh, you should have said something sooner. Mrs. Sands hurried off to the kitchen to reheat the food. Coral followed after her. May I help? Just set the table for the two of you, dear. Coral went to work setting the table while the older woman reheated the food. The smells that were coming from the stove made her even hungrier, and she wanted to insist it was too much work to heat things up. They'd just eat it cold. If she'd truly been worried about the work involved, She'd have done just that, but she knew she only wanted to eat sooner. Ten minutes later, Coral and Jackson were sitting across from one another at the table in the Sands kitchen. The pastor and Mrs. Sands joined them, and the pastor was grinning from ear to ear. Mrs. Sands doesn't let me have a second dessert unless we have company eating here late. Tonight I get two pieces of her delicious pie. Mrs. Sands frowned at her husband. Now you know you can always have another piece of pie if you want one. But you won't make me coffee to go with it if no one is here to help me drink it. Coral grinned at Jackson, taking in the banter of the older couple. 
She wondered if they too would be like that in forty or so years. They ate quickly and retired to the tiny room Mrs. Sands gave them. Coral eyed the bed skeptically, but refused to worry about it. Jackson frowned when he saw their bed for the night, but waited until the door was closed before expressing his worry. I'm not sure about that bed. Coral closed her eyes for a moment and then said, I'll sleep under the sheet, and you sleep over it. It will be fine. It's not like we're incapable of suppressing our baser urges. Jackson shrugged. Are you sure you'll be comfortable with that? She nodded. Of course I will. She looked at him. Could you please turn your back while I put my nightgown on? He nodded, presenting his back immediately. He listened to the rustle of her clothing as she changed, wishing he could turn around and just watch. They were married after all. Let me know when you're finished. Coral hurried and slid between the sheets before saying anything. I'm ready. Jackson was disappointed to find her in the bed with the sheets pulled up to her neck. Now it's your turn to turn your back. Truthfully, he didn't care if she saw him undressing or not, but he didn't want to make her uncomfortable. He slid into bed beside her, careful to keep as much distance between them as he could. He reached over and turned down the lamp before closing his eyes. Good night, Coral. Coral sighed, wishing she had something witty to say to the man lying beside her, her new husband. Good night, Jackson. Her eyes were already drifting closed. They'd had such a long day after a sleepless night. How on earth could she be expected to carry on any kind of conversation with him? Jackson stared at the ceiling, not sure if he wanted her to say something else or go straight to sleep. On one hand, if she said something else, she'd probably insist that he kiss her again. She was a bossy little thing. On the other, if she asked him to kiss her again, well, then he could kiss her again. He had just opened his mouth to suggest to her that he should kiss her goodnight, now that they were married, when he heard her even breathing. He looked over at her and sure enough, she was sound asleep beside him. It had been a long day. He closed his eyes as well, determined to leave for home as early as they could the following morning. It was going to be another long, long day. Alone. With his new wife. Chapter 4 By the time Jackson pulled into the yard of his small home the following evening, both he and Coral were exhausted. I'll fix something to eat, she said, getting down from the wagon while he went to unhitch the horses and put them up. Just something easy. Coral nodded and went into the house, her new home, for the first time. She was surprised at how tiny the place was. She wanted to cry when she saw how little space she'd have to live in, but she shook her head, refusing to get upset. Instead, she pulled her apron from her bag and put it on, pinned her hair back up, and rolled up her sleeves. The house wasn't filthy, but neither was it clean. She'd have a few days of backbreaking work to get it to the point where she felt it should be. She did the few dishes in the sink before rummaging around for food. She found some fresh eggs and some bacon, so she immediately whipped up scrambled eggs with small chunks of bacon in it. It wasn't fancy, but she was too tired to do anything more than that. When Jackson came into the house, he hung his hat on a hook by the door and took off his jacket. It was only September, but it was already getting a bit nippy in the evenings. That smells good. She smiled at him. It's just eggs with some bacon chunks. I'm hungry, so that sounds delicious. He wished he could find the right way to convey how he felt about her cooking for him. He'd tried so hard to learn during his years as a teacher, but he'd gotten nowhere. Perhaps being able to cook was in a person's genes, and he'd been born without that particular gene. He washed his hands and face using water from the pump and then sat down at the table, waiting. Coral put his plate on the table in front of him and sat down with her own plate. They each had a cup of water to drink. Do you have a cow? she asked. He nodded. I took it to one of my students to take care of while we were gone, 
she hadn't considered he'd had arrangements to make before they could leave. Well, it'll be nice to have fresh milk. I have several chickens as well, as I'm sure you've gathered. She nodded. I figured as much. I'll be thankful for the eggs for my cooking. She looked down at her plate for a moment, hesitant to bring up something she needed to talk to him about. I think we can keep sleeping like we did last night. With you on top of the sheet and me under it. It worked well. Sort of. It had been a bit awkward, of course, but not so awkward they couldn't stand it. Are you sure? He looked over at her, trying to read her face, but she was looking down at her plate, hiding her eyes from him. I can make a bed on the floor if I need to. She shook her head. I'm sure. I'm not a shrinking violet. She finished her food and walked to the sink, immediately washing the dishes she dirted. I'm going to need to get more food as well. I'm happy to have eggs and milk, but unless you have flour and sugar and other basic ingredients hidden somewhere I can't find, I'm going to need to go to town. He frowned. I didn't think of that. I can take you into Mangled Stump after school tomorrow, if you'd like. He would have to put off grading some papers, but he could still make it work. I thought that was several hours away by wagon. He nodded. It is, but if we need supplies, we need supplies. Would you mind if I took the buggy on my own? If you hitched it up, before you went to work in the morning, I would get home in the afternoon, about when you would be able to unhitch it again. He thought it over for a moment, before nodding. I'll draw you a map of how to get there in the morning. It's not difficult if you just keep following the main road. That would help a great deal if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. I like to eat. More than I should, probably. She smiled at that. Well, I'll be sure to keep you fed if you can keep me in supplies. I'll leave you with some money as well. I don't make a whole lot, but we can sure afford whatever food you want to buy. That's all we need. He nodded. All right. He stood up. I'll stay outside for twenty minutes or so to give you time to get ready for bed. Thank you. She hurriedly finished the dishes and put them away before going into the bedroom and changing. She was thankful he was so thoughtful. She was asleep as soon as her head hit the pillow, exhausted from her long days of travel. Being married was hard work. Asterisk. Driving the buggy to town was an interesting experience for Coral. Jackson had her drive him to school so she could get a feel for the horses, and then she just kept driving. She wished she had time to scrub the house before going for supplies, but it made sense to get food right away. She couldn't invite herself and her new husband to her sister's house for every meal while she got her new home cleaned. While she drove, she let her mind flow, thinking about the past couple of days. When she'd first met Jackson, she'd found him to be too rigid. He was very schoolteacherish in her mind. Now that she'd spent time with him, though, she realized that it wasn't so much that he was rigid, but more that he was uncomfortable with new situations. Having someone interested in marrying him was very new. Being married was new. As they got to know each other more, she realized that she could come to care for him. All the things about her that others found odd, he liked. He was something like she was in that regard. He'd finished school young, and was very intelligent. They both had a love for learning, which she couldn't discount. No, she was certain that if she had to marry immediately, she'd found a good man to be her husband. When she got to town, she went into the mercantile, buying the supplies necessary for a couple of weeks' worth of cooking. She immediately turned around and headed home afterward, knowing she would have to make pancakes or something equally simple for dinner again. She didn't want to have to keep making such quick meals, and she wouldn't have to any longer now that she had the ingredients she would need for something more complex. When she pulled into the yard, Jackson came out of the house. I was starting to wonder if I should worry about you, he called. She scrambled down from the buggy after setting the brake. No need to worry. It's a long drive. 
I know. I needed to know my wife was all right though. He walked close to her, taking her hand in his. I had to worry at least a little. She blushed at his attention. I'm fine. I'm glad. He looked into her eyes for a moment, and then did what he'd been wanting to do since the wedding ceremony. He leaned down and brushed his lips across hers, needing to know if what he'd felt that night was real, or just a faulty memory. When her hands wound around his back and her lips parted for his, he knew it wasn't a faulty memory. She felt a great deal of passion for him, just as he felt for her. He sighed, resting his forehead against hers. I'm not sure how I'm going to wait two months. His words were soft, but she heard them, blushing profusely. I, I got everything we needed at the store in town. He grinned slightly at her change of subject. Obviously she wasn't ready for talk of passion yet, but soon. He needed her to understand he hadn't married her only for her cooking skills. I'll help you carry everything in. He released her, reaching behind the seat of the buggy to get some of her purchases, while she went around and got more from the other side. Together, they carried them in, and while he unhitched the horses, and then graded papers, she scrubbed out the cabinets and put the supplies away. I'm going to have to make something simple tonight, because I didn't have time to start a big meal. Do you want pancakes or eggs? Let's have pancakes tonight, if you don't mind. She'd made eggs for him twice in the past 24 hours. He wasn't complaining, because he hadn't had to cook, but he would be happy to have something else. I don't mind a bit. Do you want to drink milk with them or would you rather have coffee? She saw a bucket of milk sitting on the work table that he had obviously gotten for her. Milk is fine. I prefer not to have coffee in the evenings, because it keeps me awake at night. She made a mental note of his preference and went to work on the pancakes. What are you working on? she asked. I'm grading papers. I didn't do any over the weekend, so I have a surplus of papers that need to be addressed today. Maybe I could help? She felt funny asking, because she had no idea how he'd feel about it, but she was more than willing. It would be nice to use her brain for something more than how to get a stain out of clothing. Have you ever graded papers before? She shook her head. No, but I'm sure I could do it. He studied her for a moment, before nodding. I'd like it if you'd help me. After supper dishes, then. She turned away from him, trying to hide her smile. She loved the idea that he'd let her help with something he considered important, and she'd be doing more than just feeding him and keeping his house clean. An hour later, she had all the dishes put away and joined him at the table. How can I help? He gave her a stack of papers. I gave a math test to my oldest students today. I graded the first, so you just need to use that as a guide and grade the others according to it. She nodded, her eyes immediately skimming over the test. Wait. There's an error in the first, and you didn't mark it. I used the teacher's manual. There can't be. He took the test from her and looked at it, a smile curving his lips. There is an error. Thank you for catching that. He marked the problem off and changed the grade at the top. Do you even need an answer key? She shook her head. No. I do arithmetic at an alarming speed in my head. She looked down as she said it, knowing girls weren't supposed to be good at math. That's wonderful. I sometimes get confused with some of the more advanced math. I'm better with poetry and literature. I may let you come in and teach some of that. Really? she asked. I'd love to. He grinned. I'd love the help. There are only so many things a person can excel at, and math has never been one of those things for me. I really do excel at everything. I'm not sure if it's a gift or a curse. Jackson studied her, believing her more than he had the first time she'd said that to him. Well, I'm glad you're mine then, because I definitely have flaws. Coral laughed. Oh, I didn't say I don't have flaws. I have many flaws, 
I'm just good at everything, which some consider a flaw right there. Not me. I think you're pretty wonderful. Her eyes met his, and she blushed, looking down at the paper in front of her. I'll get started then. He grinned. You do that. Chapter 5 Coral woke early and got to work fixing breakfast the next morning. She needed to bake bread and get the laundry taken care of, so it was going to be a busy morning. Jackson woke shortly after the sun was up and looked at the empty spot beside him on the bed. His new wife was truly an amazing woman. She was up before him every day. She had graded the math papers faster than he'd ever done without an answer key. She didn't intimidate him, exactly, because how could a 17-year-old girl do so? She did make him wonder how she'd become so good at everything she did, though. When he walked into the main room of the house, he found her up to her elbows in bread dough. Good morning, he said, still rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Good morning. Her eyes stayed on the bread dough she was kneading, but her heart started racing at his presence. Breakfast is in the oven keeping warm. Give me a minute to wash up, and I'll serve it for you. We're not in a hurry. I need to go out and milk Lizzie anyway. Lizzie? Is that the cow's name? I've already taken care of that. Then I'll collect the eggs. She nodded to a basket of eggs on the work table. Already done. Then I'll step outside for a bit of sunshine before breakfast. How long has the woman been up? Doesn't she need sleep? He was feeling like a sloth in comparison, a feeling he'd never had before. Okay, but don't take long. Breakfast will be on the table in ten minutes. Jackson stepped outside and went to the outhouse to take care of personal business. After walking back to the house, he leaned against the side, breathing deeply. He loved mornings. The air seemed fresher, and he always felt so hopeful with the whole day spread out before him. He didn't know if he'd gotten the feeling from his time on the farm with his stepfather, but he was sure the man hadn't hurt any. He'd been a jovial man to work with, and Jackson thanked God every day that he was the one his mother had chosen to marry after his father's untimely demise. Shaking his head, he opened the door to the house and walked straight to the pump to wash his hands. What are your plans for the day? he asked. Coral was surprised by the question. Did men usually ask their wives how they planned to stay busy? I'm going to catch up on the laundry, bake bread, give the house a good fall cleaning, including blacking the stove and washing down all the walls. I'll make supper. If I have time left, I'll bake a cake and scrub the floors. I wish I had time to do the windows today but those will have to wait until tomorrow. He shook his head. You know you don't have to do everything today, don't you? You have the rest of your life to clean and cook. She nodded. I do know. I want to get a good start on the chores, though. I can do things I'll enjoy once everything here is caught up. I'd like to go visit my sister, but I won't do it until the house is in shipshape condition. He took his seat at the table and waited as she brought him his plate. Eggs, bacon and biscuits. The biscuits looked so fluffy, he couldn't wait to sink his teeth into one of them. You can visit her any time you want. I'm not trying to keep you from her. He couldn't resist. Without waiting to pray, he took a huge bite of the biscuit, and he almost groaned at the pleasure. These are delicious. I know I can go see her without finishing, but I like to reward myself for tasks well done. So if I can get everything finished by the end of the day Thursday, I'll walk over there on Friday. Would you mind if I invited her and Brody to supper Friday night? No, of course not. Do whatever makes you happy. And he'd keep eating her biscuits. He reached for a jar of jam in the middle of the table something he'd been given by one of his students as a new teacher gift, and he spread it on the biscuit, taking another bite. Will you promise to make these biscuits for me every day for as long as we're both alive? Coral laughed. I'll make biscuits as often as you like. 
She took her seat across from him and reached out to take his hand. He said a quick prayer for them and went back to concentrating on his biscuit. You don't ever have to cook anything else. Just these biscuits. She tilted her head to one side to study him. You seem a bit obsessed with the biscuits this morning, Jackson. Call me Jack, if you don't mind. That's what my family calls me. Jack? I haven't heard anyone else call you that. He nodded. As I said, family calls me that. You've never met my family. Will I? she asked. Probably. They're not so far away that we can't visit. Maybe during the summer break next year, we can head over. All right. She looked down at her food and took a bite of the eggs. I promise, I won't be cooking eggs for every meal now that I have supplies. Do I sound like I'm complaining? These biscuits are incredible. Coral laughed at that. You really are obsessed with the biscuits, aren't you? She leaned forward as if to impart a great secret. After Jackson, Jack, leaned in to hear it, she whispered, wait until you taste my bread. His eyes widened. Better than the biscuits? She nodded, one corner of her mouth turned up in amusement. I love to cook. I'm so glad you do, he said with a smile. You're not planning on going anywhere, are you? I mean, I really get to keep you? Yes, my cooking is here to stay. I don't just want your cooking, Coral. I hope you know that. She shrugged, looking down at her plate. She knew her value was in what she could do and not in the person she was. She'd always known that. All right. He frowned, realizing that he'd upset her without meaning to. He'd have to find a way to make it up to her. He was just beginning to realize what an incredible woman he'd married, and he hoped he could find a way to make her realize it as well. After he left for school, Coral got back to work, punching down the bread before starting on the long task of laundry. It was shortly before eleven when she realized she hadn't sent him off to work with a lunch. She searched until she found a lunch pail, and she cut off two huge slices of the bread she'd made, buttering them with the store-bought butter she'd purchased the day before. She fried up a few pieces of bacon and added them before pouring some water into a jar. She added an apple and covered the whole thing with a napkin. She started on the ten-minute walk to the schoolhouse, thinking about what she'd already done. All of the laundry was on the line, the bread was finished, the walls had been scrubbed. She was ahead of the schedule she'd made for herself, and smiled. She might possibly have some time to do a spot of hunting for supper. She did so prefer fresh meat to meat she'd purchased at the store. She didn't want to interrupt school, but she didn't want Jack to go hungry, so she went into the coat room at the front of the schoolhouse and peered around the wall making certain he wasn't in the middle of a lesson. She smiled when she saw him sitting at his desk, still working on grading the mountain of papers he'd brought home the previous evening, and all the children were working diligently at some task at their desks. Coral stepped into the classroom, walking up the aisle between the desks, to set Jack's lunch on his desk in front of him. I didn't think to make you a lunch this morning, so I brought it now. He smiled up at her and nodded. I've gotten quite used to doing without lunch, so I thank you. I'll see you this afternoon. She turned quickly to leave, realizing the eyes of every one of his students were on her. Wait a moment. He stood, walking over to her, and putting a casual arm around her shoulders. Children, I got married on Saturday, and I want to introduce you all to my wife, Coral. The children all eyed her, curiously. Good morning, children. She had no idea what he wanted her to say, but she was certain that would be appropriate regardless. The children all chorused back, Good morning, Mrs. Smythe. She was startled to hear his last name applied to her, and she looked over at Jackson who looked like he was pleased to hear it. She gave a quick wave to the students, and hurried down the aisle, to walk back home. As she walked, she smiled to herself. He certainly wasn't ashamed of her if he'd introduce his students to her that way.
She stepped into the house and grabbed the rifle she had spotted leaning against a corner. She was back home 45 minutes later, with two rabbits strung over one shoulder. She quickly hung them in the tree to bleed out, her stomach already growling at the notion of rabbit stew for supper. She buttered a slice of bread for her lunch and sat down for long enough to eat it with a glass of milk, before getting up to scrub the floors. The house would be in perfect shape before the weekend or her name wasn't Coral, Smythe. Her name was Coral Smythe. Why that brought a smile to her lips, she didn't know. By the time Jack was home from school, and it was hard to think of him as Jack still, but she was determined to do it, she had accomplished everything she'd had on the agenda for the day and then some. Rabbit stew was simmering on the stove, and she'd baked a spice cake for dessert. She was sitting in a chair beside the table, working on mending the clothes she'd found needed it when she'd done the laundry. Jack took one step into the house and stopped in his tracks, inhaling deeply. Something smells delicious. She smiled. It's either the rabbit stew I'm cooking, the bread I baked earlier, or the cake I made for dessert. He sighed happily. A man could get used to being treated this way. He looked around the house and noticed all the little things she'd done that day to make it shine. It hadn't been that clean when he'd moved in. House looks great. She smiled. There are still several things I want to get done to it this week, but I'm happy with how it's taking shape. He put the books, papers, and lunch pail in his hands on the table before sitting down beside her. He waited until she looked up at him before he took the pants she was mending from her hands and put them on the table. Then he took both her hands in his. I don't know what I've done to deserve you, but I thank God every day for putting you in my life. I hope you know how much you're already coming to mean to me. Coral smiled, a distant look in her eyes. I think you're going to be a much better husband than I thought on that first night. He grinned. And I know you'll be a much better wife than I thought that first night. In response, she stood and got him a small slice of the cake she'd baked with a glass of milk. I'm sure you're hungry after your long day of work. She sat down and resumed her sewing, her heart sad. 